All right, um, I wanted to start by thanking the, the organizers for uh, um, the invitation and, and organizing a really, really uh, interesting conference. I'm, I'll try to do my part and follow up on the, the amazing talks uh, so far. Um, I want to start by thanking the folks that uh, actually make this possible. So here's a few of the collaborators that have made uh, this possible. I'll mention the students um, throughout, uh, but key collaborators. So Fernando uh, already spoke earlier in this workshop. We've worked with him on uh, simulating some of the uh, assembly aspects, also uh, related molecular dynamic simulations with uh, Paulette Clancy. Um, Lena Korkotis in, uh, in applied physics on some of the electron microscopy work they'll show today. Um, Frank Weiss on the electronic structure uh, characterization and analysis. Uh, Detlef Smilgis at the synchrotron um, on the X-ray characterization and Rich Robinson uh, on the magic cluster synthesis that I'll talk about in the, in the second half um, of the talk. So I want to start with this as sort of the overall um, vision uh, summary as far as where, where we are currently um, uh, in the field of directed assembly of, of some of these materials. And I think it's, it's a super exciting time to, to think about it and to connect to what um, Sharon um, mentioned last night as far as you know, looking back 20 years and then thinking where this is going to be um, in, in the next 20 years, I think is a really, really uh, interesting way to think about it. My personal uh, introduction to this was with uh, Brian Korgel roughly 20 years ago, and um, the initial conversation went something like this. So you have to imagine, um, you know, California surfer dude kind of attitude. Um, I was asking him, um, you know, basically, what are you working on? And his take was, we're going to make these particles, we're going to put them in a beaker, and we're going to shake it up, and we're going to make a quantum computer, and it's going to be really cool. Um, that was 20 years ago, and what a gift to have that as sort of a, an inspiration and a and a vision as to, as to where we are. So, we, you know, we don't have quantum computers yet, but in terms of um, having access to materials with a broad range of uh, tunable composition and size and shape and dimensionality to control the properties of individual building blocks and then to put them into functional superstructures in which they can programmably and purposefully interact to get emergent properties, I think is, is just a, a really interesting playground uh, to be in at, at that point. So we, we envision ourselves as essentially master builders. I get to tell my kids, basically, I play with Legos um, when I go to work um, as, as part of what I do. But then to think about what happens between now and uh, 2040, and we've had some discussions yesterday about this as a, as a back to the future exercise. And in fact, I ask a lot of my students now when they're writing their thesis to put this in the last chapter of the thesis, some projections about where do you think this field will be in 2040? Because at least in a PhD thesis, there's a higher probability that you'll be able to access it some years in the future. But I think it's, it's really interesting to think about now, and maybe we should even capture this somewhere, um, as to how do we integrate all these aspects? How do we integrate advances in um, computational simulation and theoretical understanding of these systems in having essentially the design principles uh, encode, for example, a 3D printer such that you could put in inks of you know, particle A, B, and C and make functional superstructures. And not just make you know, pretty crystals, but to think about um, essentially make structures that you can't make, structures and functionalities that you can't make in any other way. Right? So one example would be, um, here's a picture of an electronic leaf, but I don't mean making you know, something that converts CO2 to something else. It's essentially, it would be a commodity process. Make something special. Think about how biology, for example, does catalysis in terms of um, enzymatic catalysis. Very different uh, from how inorganic systems conventionally do catalysis. It's very static. But in an, in an enzymatic system, in a biological system, things are moving around. So if you could combine motion with uh, sort of external modulation, and um, have, have rearrangement within that structure such that you can drive complicated chemical reactions in a way similar to that biology does now, but with materials that biology hasn't yet had access to. I think that would be um, an interesting projection for, for 2040. So if I had to put one bullet item for 2040, um, something like that I think would be, would be interesting. So that's the, the uh, overall sort of um, Perspective similar to the spirit that we had yesterday, I'll have 
two vignettes. Um, the first part of the talk will be on um, emergent structure and emergent properties. In this case, these are uh, lead sulfide and lead selenide um, quantum knots, similar to the great work that uh, Dimitri showed earlier. So the first part is how do you get from isolated particles the emergence of uh, these sort of interconnected structures shown here. Um, and these are theoretical calculations from uh, Daniel von Markerberg suggesting that you can get um, uh, sophisticated electronic properties similar to what you would get, for example, in, in graphene, um, uh, uh, Dirac cones and uh, topological edge states and things like that. Um, the second part is similar theme. You know, you have, you have um, colloidal building blocks. In this case, these are um, cadmium sulfide magic size clusters, uh, and they assemble into these structures and emergent properties, in this case, optical properties, that I'll talk about in the, in the second half. Um, so first, the, the practical matter, how do you actually make these? So we're doing the assembly essentially at a fluid interface. And in principle, you could do this in your kitchen, right? As long as you had some surface with water, we actually use ethylene glycol, but you just need an interface of two immiscible fluids. You spread one liquid across it. So in this case, this is a colloidal solution of particles. You spread that across, and the, the reference to Ben Franklin here is that he did a similar experiment, if you want to call it that, in 1773. Um, put a teaspoon of oil on a, on a pond somewhere and noted that it, that it smoothened out. Um, so we're going a little bit beyond that. It's assembling the particles, so spreading the solution across. And then the second step is that you actually leverage the chemistry at this interface to, in this case, connect the particles. So you can have a chemical species in the subface, something like ethylene diamine, that would complex with the ligand. So the ligand has essentially a semi-infinite uh, direction that it can go into the subface, and then you can interconnect the particles as is shown here. Right, that's the that's the big picture. Of course, the details always add a bit more uh, complexity. The process is essentially again illustrated here. Um, you assemble the particles, you add the chemical trigger, and you recover the sample. Um, if you then zoom in, the subprocesses that are happening you have initially a disordered, relatively disordered system, and you have a change in the translational order of the constituent particle, as well as in the arrangement and ultimately the coupling, right? So this is in many ways like a 2D polymerization. You can actually think of these as, as monomers, and they connect similar to what's shown in this cartoon here. So the particles initially are something like what's shown in panel D, where you have a ligand coverage. This is approximately um, the actual ligand coverage that you, that you have on these particles. Um, typically start out with oleic acid, and the binding energy is actually facet-specific. So the binding energy is weakest on these 1, uh, zero, 0, the yellow facets, so they actually transform during the assembly into a patchy particle, and the patchy particles then um, attach into structures similar to what's shown here. And so the characterization approach combines essentially um, X-ray scattering, electron microscopy, and a bit of modeling to understand things that we, that we can't actually probe directly experimentally. So one question from the onset is, you have identical building blocks, like these essentially truncated cubes shown here, but depending on how you orient them at the fluid interface, you can get different polytypes. Right? You can imagine having this cube, and I play around with these in the office with 3D printed cubes. It's a, it's a great uh, sort of illustrative tool to, to kind of look at what could happen. If they're oriented with the 1, 0, 0 up, so the square face up, then the structure that would form is a square super lattice. If they're oriented with the 1, 1, 1 facet up, then now it actually is difficult to see from this image, but they can't connect in plane, but they have to connect out of plane. Right? So half of the particles are slightly above the surface and half are slightly below, and what you get is this honeycomb structure shown here. Um, the third variation is if you have 1, 0, 0 up. Now in this case, you have two faces through which you can connect in plane, you can form these one-dimensional structures shown here. All right, so a question then is, what governs a, the orientation of these and what governs what sort of structure do you actually form from both a, a thermodynamic and a kinetic perspective? And this is some of the work that we've done with Fernando in addressing these questions um, from a thermodynamic perspective to look at, okay, what's the free energy? Suppose you have a particle at that fluid interface and you assign a surface energy to each of these facets, you can then identify, okay, what's the preferred, 
The thermodynamically preferred orientation, given the height um, and these angles, Euler angles shown here, right? So that's a thermodynamic argument for actually mapping out what's the thermodynamically preferred uh, configuration, in this case, one, zero, zero up. The kinetic argument, and this is not animated, but um, you can think about it going from a low density state to a high density state. If you look at the red trace, you find that there's actually a kinetically intermediate state of this psi six. So hexagonal ordering is favored at an intermediate stage during the assembly, but then it switches from hexagonal to the square assembly. Right? So this would be an example of a kinetic product from a, from a, from a chemical uh, perspective. Um, the actual process itself, if you really think about all of the things that happen while you form assemblies at the interface, so you spread the particles, um, the solvent evaporates, the particles assemble, the particles attach, and the ligand goes into the subface. It's close to a miracle that this works at all, and beyond that, to think about the, the types of um, super lattices that you can form in terms of the, uh, the, the long-range um, coherence in these structures. Like, so here's an example of one of the in situ experiments that we've done at CHESS. In this case, the trough um, is, is close to a, a two inch, um, essentially concave uh, liquid interface. You have the X-ray beam that goes through, and in real time, you can monitor small angle scattering and wide angle scattering. Like, so the small angle scattering gives you information about um, systems at large separation, so you can figure out the particle-particle um, orientation and, and, and relative positioning. The wide angle scattering gives you an indication for what's the orientation of atomic lattices within an individual particle. But you, can, you can monitor both of these in real time and figure out what's happening. So one of the interesting things from this study was that if you, if you park your beam right here and then spread your liquid across, similar to uh, what, what Franklin did, is that um, there's an early stage transient signature. I can either uh, show it to you later or refer you to the paper. Essentially, there's a monolayer of particles that race across the interface. After that, the particles essentially act like a surfactant. After the particles go across, um, the bulk liquid or the bulk colloidal suspension goes across, and then you have the assembly process. So um, what's interesting is that when you think about the initial stages during the assembly, it's not actually a pristine fluid surface that you then populate with this colloidal suspension, but you have this pre-nucleation layer, and that also um, impacts what sort of structure you form afterwards. So that's an interesting insight from the in situ studies, and it informs a little bit this sort of um, uh, symmetry transformation inspired in part by this Escher uh, tessellations up here, going from a hexagonal structure of unconnected particles to a square uh, structure of, of connected particles um, during the, the second stage of this process. So you can put that on, on pretty um, Escher images, but if you think about it mechanistically, it's still amazing to think about, okay, you have a system that has a lot of ligands on it, and it's initially in one type of symmetry, and then they connect epitaxially. And it's a process that involves uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of irreversible attachments that somehow are orchestrated and coordinated to give you super lattices that are not just tens of nanometers, but hundreds of nanometers and microns in length, right? So um, it's, it's essentially uh, yeah, not, not really well understood yet as to what, uh, what really drives that, but um, um, I'll give you what, what at least we know at, at this stage. So, one of the questions then in trying to understand that is essentially what happens first. And uh, Zing Shen showed something similar yesterday as far as uh, the, the relative emergence of translation and orientation. So you can ask a question of transformation pathway. You have a system that's essentially initially hexatic. So the particles have a, a hexagonal ordering but are randomly oriented relative to the plane of the interface. Um, and then ultimately you have a different uh, transformation ordering and orientation ordering. So the question is, which happens first? Does it go this pathway? Does it do both change at the same time? Or does it go through this pathway shown here? That's difficult to do by x-ray scattering, because you're probing a very large section of your, of your film. Um, 
But you can get insights into that from TEM. And you might look at this and say, okay, that's not, you know, that's not re really interesting or informative um, TEM image that uh, um, Michelle and Jessica put together, but the information content in this image is on the order of a few gigabytes. The reason for that is because for every pixel in this image, we have an electron diffraction pattern, right? So something that um, uh, David Muller and uh, Lena Kokotis had developed as this uh, pixel array detector, you can essentially look at that image and then for every particle and even within every particle, you can do a diffraction pattern to look at local varying, uh, locally varying structures. So we've looked at, for, for example, uh, mechanical stresses um, through the bridges and, and across the particle. But in the context of the assembly questions here, you can then precisely map out the in-plane ordering and out-of-plane ordering of every particle in the field of view. Right? So it involves quite a bit of coding to, to um, transfer you know, gigabytes of data into, into actual knowledge, but essentially what this process looks like is you get um, the two orderings, you can get the superlight structure, generate the Voronoi diagram here, and then get a derived model that provides you a particle by particle picture of um, how these particles are actually oriented. And one of the insights from this is that A, the, the um, pathway through which this transformation happens, we've done this for uh, a series of different uh, samples during the transformation, is that the preferred pathway seems to be uh, along this direction first, that there's a, a change in the orientation first, and then a change in the, uh, in the translation. The other insight is that if you look at some of these transient states, there's this preferred axis along the 1, 1, N um, direction shown here. So what that suggests is that there's some interaction between the, um, and I'm, I apologize, the, the color coding is different than what I had before, but these uh, uh, triangular facets here, the blue facets, those are the ones that still have ligands on them. So effectively, one way you can think about it is that you have residual ligands on these facets here that can still interact with each other and have some structure directing function, whereas the ligands on the other facets are already removed and, and made the, um, the system available for uh, epitaxial attachment. And so from a, um, from a big picture perspective, it's, a, it's an interesting model system of these um, mesocrystals, or as, as Detlef Smiljus calls them, uh, crystals of crystals, where you have a super lattice, and in this picture, Every dot is one of the, uh, the nanocrystals, about um, seven nanometers or so in diameter. On the right-hand side, it's the same sample, but now with, whoops, with atomic resolution. There we go. Um, showing you the, uh, the rock salt atomic uh, uh, crystal structure. So what's interesting then from a fundamental perspective is to make analogies between um, the emergent properties of these systems compared to atomic systems, right? If, if, you, if you take this essentially as an artificial atom um, and then think about, okay, what sort, of, uh, what sort of bonding configurations do you get? What sort of emergent uh, structures do you get? The one that's perhaps easiest to, to look at is to say, okay, graphene has a lot of interesting uh, emergent electronic properties. What if you look at this in the closest analog to that in essentially a monolayer of the hexagonally uh, connected structures here? So there, there's Similar, but there's a number of, of key uh, differences to keep in mind. One that I'll point out right away is that on the left-hand side, every atom is identical, truly identical. On the right-hand side, no two particles are truly identical. They're similar, really similar, but it's like snowflakes, right? They have a similar shape, they have the same composition, but there's minute differences, and those things will come back later. So um, if you look at one of these hexagonal assemblies, so this is the structure for which there are some very um, compelling theoretical predictions as to what sort of properties um, you might expect in these systems and that you, that you might actually uh, realize. But the, the key difference is that in the theoretical calculations, every constituent particle is identical. Right? So then there's this, this question, I guess, this is a, a pervasive in terms of um, experiment, experimentalists and computationalists is we deal with inevitable disorder. So what's the impact of that disorder on those predictions? How close to these predictions can you actually get? So in the experimental system, there's three types of disorder that we've examined before. One is the on-site energy disorder, 
So you can make particles that are, let's say, um, 6.5 nanometers plus or minus um, half a nanometer, right? And that's already, that's, that's pretty close to um, plus or minus uh, a, a unit cell. So that's about as good as you can probably get. So you have that on-site energy disorder. You have a coupling disorder, so you might have some epitaxially connected bridges that are, let's say, five unit cells, some that are seven, and that impacts the electronic coupling between the dots. And if that's not enough, you have sort of, um, in, in a more coarse-grained form, um, not 100% of the particles are connected. You can get to, you know, maybe 80%, 90% or so, but it's not perfect, not as in the, uh, the theoretical model. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you have that, you have strain. You can, you can make a list of other disorders that contribute to that here. We just, we just focused on three for which we have direct experimental input, right? So we can get, um, we can get each of those directly from the microscopy images that we have here. Um, strain we can also get, but that was not included in, in the, the, um, the model at this stage. So um, Kevin, and uh, he just showed this at a, at a group meeting kind of out of, out of nowhere one day, um, just to illustrate sort of what you can actually get from a TM image. You can actually map out the charge transfer rate. If it's hopping between two closely connected particles, all you really need is how close are they relative to one another and what's uh, the energy mismatch. So you can get this from the TEM image, and you can get this from the TEM image as well, because you know the size, and if you know the size, you know the energy level. So you can kind of map out, okay, what would electron transport actually look like um, in a system like that? And that, that doesn't look very uh, cool. Uh, yeah, this is this is just based on these two parameters here. So it's not um, it's it's uh, not that rigorous, mostly for illustrative purposes. Yeah, this, it, it's not it's not as it's not as rigorous. So that wasn't that wasn't actually published. It's just for illustrative purposes. The more rigorous work was then actually um, so Frank Weiss did electronic structure calculations on these. Um, uh, uh, Kevin did the, the uh, transport measurements, variable temperature transport measurements, and the conclusion was that um, whereas you would like to have delocalization in order to realize those properties that I showed you earlier, you would like to have delocalization across a long range of, of particles, currently we're limited to a few, um, you know, maybe four or five or on, on the order of ten or so dots um, across which you can currently uh, delocalize it. But it doesn't, it, this doesn't factor in um, the more advanced surface chemistries that uh, Dimitri spoke about earlier. It just gives you some perspective on the inherent disorder that you have in the systems as we're currently making them. So, um, how am I doing on time? Whoops. That was part one. Now, part two, uh, similar theme, but there's a bonus. You have emergent anisotropy. Oops, let me draw that again. Um, Emergent anisotropy in addition to emergent structure and emergent properties. So um, this part of the story has a number of interesting surprises. So it, it didn't actually start out as um, making super lattices. It started out as one of those uh, scalable nanomanufacturing projects where we were looking at how do you scale up the particle synthesis you know, by a factor of um, 40 or so, which is a classical chemical engineering problem. You know, you have an interesting synthesis at small scale. Let's make it. 10 times bigger or 100 times bigger and see what you get. Um, so common wisdom for the colloidal synthesis at small scales is that you do a hot injection synthesis. So you want to have a well-defined nucleation and growth event. You want to have one nucleation and then all of them grow at the same time. And the way you do this is that you stir it vigorously and very quickly inject it. That's a way to have controlled nucleation and growth. So, um, going from 50 milliliters to, two, to uh, essentially two liters, um, we've gone, we've increased not only the volume overall, but also increased the concentration. So if you think about this from the perspective of hot injection synthesis, it seems like a really bad idea, right? Um, you can make a lot of stuff, but um, it might not be that monodisperse. So uh, here's an interesting surprise. When we looked at the optical spectra of the particles that came out of this, it's a very sharp absorption peak. Granted, the TM looked a little different, 
um, than what we're used to. It doesn't look like what we've had before. And if you do X-ray structure characterization, um, you find that they have this hexagonal ordering. Uh, the atomic structure is not the same as what you would expect for a larger particle. And the pair distribution function analysis, I'll, I'll um, show you a little bit more um, in a second. So key to this synthesis is that it's not, you shouldn't think of it uh, through the lens of hot injection synthesis and how do you scale that up. What's fundamentally different here is that you actually leverage the phase behavior. You get into a regime where the particle behaves as effectively like a metal soap. And the phase behavior stabilizes the small size of the particles and what you're actually getting is, is something um, similar to a liquid crystal uh, uh, as is shown in the, uh, the cartoons on the, on the top right here. So then we've looked at the electronic structure of these systems and, and Rich Robinson was actually on sabbatical in Uri's lab at, the, at this point. So we had these systems and uh, Rich wanted to do some uh, um, spectroscopy experiments on these. So uh, we've done the pair distribution function from total scattering at Cornell and sent him a sample and he measured it, but his exotonic peak was at 313. So then there was confusion about, hey, you sent me the wrong sample, it's not the same one. Um, and then sent the sample back and we looked at uh, total scattering there and if you look very carefully, you note that, okay, not only the exotonic absorption is different, but also the structure is slightly different. So, um, and by the way, this is, this is reversible once you actually uh, figure out what drives that. So, um, what drives this is that for these particles, they're, they're about two nanometers in size. You're in different size regime compared to, let's say, five nanometer or 10 nanometer particles. So, the interactions are different. What drives this reversible isomerization is that it changed the binding motif and the surface chemistry, and that it effectively permeates throughout the entire cluster to change the structure, as I showed you in a, in a PDF before. So you can, you can test that by um, FTIR and XPS, and it essentially conclude that you have a hydroxyl species at the surface that drives this, this uh, entire um, isomerization of the, of the particle. Um, so then, that was an interesting surprise, and there's yet one more. When we looked at the assembly of these, uh, you've seen earlier on that it's not, you know, it's not some square assembly or hexagonal assembly. It forms these uh, anisotropic structures shown here, and it's interesting that it goes across many orders of magnitude in length scale. The key to this assembly is that instead of it being at a, at a fluid interface, this is confined between two glass plates something effectively similar to, to a, like a Hela Shaw cell, right? That you have a spacer uh, a few microns apart and then you have a liquid droplet in between. And the nice thing about this is that you have very well-defined evaporation conditions. Like you know the partial pressure outside of your cell, you know the partial pressure here, and it's a, it's a, um, a well-defined and well-controlled arrangement to do evaporation-driven assembly. So the structures, this is appropriately timed um, before lunch are uh, in some ways reminiscent of, of uh, ramen noodles, um, where you have these systems that uh, essentially mimic um, uh, 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 liquid crystal. They arrange, as is shown here, and each, uh, each filament is composed of the, the, the clusters as is shown in the cartoon in the, in the bottom left. Um, so here's a, a movie, might be most boring movie of the, uh, of the conference if there's an award for that, but it's essentially the in situ um, observation of the formation of these structures here. Right? So we do optical microscopy, and we look at these structures form as the liquid meniscus evaporates from right to left. And you can actually analytically model that as well in terms of the, the Peclet number, um, uh, essentially the ratio of uh, diffusion within the system to the, uh, um, the evaporation and the recession of that, of that interface, and you can get some idea on for example, concentration gradients um, within this liquid here. Um, if you then take the same data, so that's in, in panel A, it's essentially that video, um, but just sliced up across you know, about a minute. So the interface recedes at about a micron a second. Um, it forms these structures shown here, and if you think about what happens is that you have convection of new fibers to the interface, you have diffusion away from it because you have that concentration gradient, and you have two key processes. One is hydrodynamic shear. So the one-dimensional fibers align in the direction of, of shear. That's one, but then they're stretched. 
And when it relaxes, they buckle. And they form these undulations shown here. Right? So you can see um, an initial mode, the fastest growing mode, and then this final undulation shown here. It's about a two, um, two micron. It, it, it varies a little bit, but that's, that's the, the, the variation that you see here. Very similar things have been, have been seen in, uh, in liquid crystals, by the way. Um, now, here's the last surprise. You do that assembly, you flip it, and the structures are chiral. That's interesting, number one. And the chirality is opposite on the two interfaces. So you have some symmetry breaking process during this assembly. So Alex did a, a nice job looking at this and, and trying to decouple this from uh, the, the circular dichroism, from the linear dichroism and, and biofringence, because you, these structures are highly anisotropic, so you have to be careful about um, claiming what is actually circular dichroism versus, um, versus other properties. But fundamentally, they're, um, they're chiral. So the key to understanding this is to recognize that the propagation of those undulations is not concentric, as is shown here. That might, in, in some ways, theoretically, that's perhaps an easier explanation. But it's actually this spiral propagation. And that's the intriguing aspect about chirality in the first place. If you think about, essentially, any structure at any length scale that we know of has some sort of chirality associated with it, whether it's galaxies or uh, you know, spin and subatomic processes, um, or, or uh, particles, rather. Um, so in, in this case, essentially, if you look at the, the propagation of these bands, um, there's, a, there's a directionality to them. Right? So you can, you can map this out um, via the, the microscopy images. So the, the explanation that we have um, for now is essentially an analog to what's known in the liquid crystal community as the chemical Lehmann effect, which is if you have a chemical potential gradient, and it's very well defined in this case, because the vapor pressure here is the saturation pressure. The vapor pressure here is zero. So you have a radially well-defined chemical potential gradient. If that is coupled to the director of the liquid crystal, we have to do you know, right-hand rule um, to figure out uh, essentially how these are coupled. Essentially, the coupling between these um, gives rise to a torque. And the torque drives the spiral propagation of that meniscus, right? So if you then think about it, the fibers align in the direction of the shear. It's the interaction between the green and the purple. That's the shear-driven alignment. And then the torque from the chemical Lehmann effect um, orients them either this way or that way. So they're always opposite. It's stochastic as to which one is which, but they're always opposite. So that drives the, uh, the symmetry breaking um, between these systems here and gives you, gives you different chirality. So, that's uh, two different uh, vignettes or, or model systems in terms of uh, where we are now. And um, yeah, looking forward to a good discussion on this. Okay, so we have Yeah. Beautiful talk. Thank you. René van Roy from uh, Utrecht University. Thank you. Um, you showed these uh, these uh, uh, particles in this quasi 2D fluid fluid uh, interface, uh, but you did not consider any capillary interactions. Did you? Are, are they important? Um, we've looked at that with uh, Fernando also. Um, for this size range, I don't think they are. I think um, Daniel van Makelberg and the name of the student escapes me right now, but they did molecular dynamics and kinetic Monte Carlo. Um, they looked at capillary interactions as well, but if, if I remember right, they came to the same conclusion that for this particle size range, it's not critical. For, for larger particles, it becomes relevant. Thanks. Tobias Krauss from uh, INM. Thanks, Thanks for the talk. Um, so uh, you showed that there is this um, convection processes and also all kinds of things happening while uh, you are forming this, this drying monolayer on your liquid liquid or gas liquid interface. And I think Daniel van Meckelberg and a couple other people have reported for certain cases that actually towards the end it becomes very dynamic. Now there's the spiral, there's videos, and we also have recorded some of those crazy videos. And I was wondering whether this is now better understood or whether you have ideas on what this means and also whether this is connected to, say, your um, fusion in only one direction. 
Um, oh, okay. Speaking of crazy videos. videos, yeah, we, we have our collection of crazy videos as well. <laughs> this just adds to, you know, I had the long list of these are all the things that are happening. And if you do a video and you look at this process, right, you have essentially this, this uh, droplet of supersaturated dots forming here. You're covering it and you're changing the vapor pressure right here. Um, all of these processes seem so far out of control. So then to think about, okay, now a student comes in, and I think Kevin's hand will come in in a second, and he'll get a TM sample out of this top right corner in a little bit. Um, yeah, there you go. He, he uncovers it, so, right? So then it's a, a capillary-driven effect as far as driving these closer to the surface, and I think he's coming in with a TM grid right about now at some point. There you go. Um, and ca captures the sample. And the fact that these assemblies are so well ordered and connected across long ranges, um, yeah, to me it's a mystery. Other than listing these are the perturbations and, and just being amazed by it, I don't have a better explanation, sorry. Okay, so we have to work on that, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, between now and 2040, hopefully. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> thank you Tobias. Uh, for the lead sulfide, you have these uh, bridges forming uh, quite easily. Um, and that doesn't happen, I think, in other in the other semiconductor uh, nanocrystals like the cadmium selenide or three fives. What is the reason? Is there a connection to what we heard also from from Dimitri in the previous talk maybe? Or what, why is it so easy to do or happening in, in, in the lead sulfide and lead selenide? Um, I, one is um, probably due to, due to the uh, atomic crystal structure being slightly different in these versus um, uh, zinc blend and wurzite in the, in the cat salts. There is a workaround. So uh, Daniel von Markeberg, for example, has shown that you can, you can form it initially with lead salt and then do ion exchange and have a cat salt uh, lattice afterward. But as far as why, why is it easy for the uh, lead salt but not for the cat salt, I think it's um, related to the atomic structure of the, of the constituent dots, right? If you have a bare, um, two bare 100 surfaces, um, easily align and easily connect. Um, if you had two bare 111 surfaces, I don't think the story is that easy because it could be either lead terminated or calcogen terminated. So then you already have some additional perturbation that would potentially limit how, how well they connect or not. And I think um, an extension of that, right? So if, if, you, if you approach the, the answer um, by looking at in lead salts, 100 attaches, 111 doesn't, and extend that to, to cat salts. I think it, the answer is somewhere in there. It's, it's related to the atomic structure of the, the exposed, deprotected facets. Marilyn. Thank you very much for a beautiful talk, uh, Marilyn Dextra, Utrecht University. Um, so in the beginning, if you go from this FCC to a square lattice, the particle uh, orientational disorder at the beginning. So there's no preferential orientation of the particles at the interface? Um, uh, they, I think the, 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 the pathway, um, I think is closer to three. So you have an orientation ordering first and then a translational rearrangement. Yeah, but at the beginning it says, Orientational disorder. Yeah. The FCC. Yeah. Okay. So there's no preferential orientation at the um, absorbed state. Uh, at, a, at a fluid interface, you mean? Yeah. Um, I it it what? it depends. Um, if you do it, the way this is done is dispersed from hexane on ethylene glycol. Then there's no initially preferred ordering. If you disperse it from, for example, toluene on ethylene glycol, I think. You actually start out with closer in, in this state, right? So it's a it's a fine detail, but I think part of it is that you have some capillary condensation of solvent in the interstitial space, and it's one of those little details that impacts, for example, the preferred ordering, right? because so if you does this also really depend on the molecular details of the system? So because the interface here it is sketched as a flat interface with zero thickness. But in principle, it should have a certain thickness the interface. Oh, the, the interface itself, yeah. Um, Fernando had actually looked at that. It's not, you know, this is, this is an, an anatomically abrupt uh, for the purposes of the, of the cartoon, but at, at, the, at the actual length scales that are relevant, there's a, there's a gradient. If you had, let's say, a layer of, 
uh, hexane on top, and then this for ethane glycol. It's not atomically erupt, but there's a there's a gradient in there, and that impacts that as well. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk. For your last section with uh, ramen chirality, mm. um, where does chirality comes from? On the for the between or different between top surface and bottom surface, is it? Chirality of the uh, Raman bundle or the chirality of the spiral uh, as it propagates? Actually, I did a I did a bad job explaining that. So thank you. Um, it's not um, well. I'll show you what we initially thought. Um, remember the part about they isomerize. So initially we thought, ah, oh, maybe you know, there's a torque on the fiber, and that torque gets transferred onto the ligand shell around the particle, surrounding the particle, and we know from the isomerization paper that small changes in the binding motif can change the electronic structure. So maybe if you deform the ligand shell this way or that way, the constituent particles change chirality. Um, but that's difficult to reconcile with, with the experimental observations, in part also because um, then you'd have the chirality emerging from dipolar interactions between the particles, but they're, they're pretty far apart from one another. So a simpler explanation would be to say, okay, chirality transfer is between this level and that level. So it's similar to, um, in the liquid crystal community, this is referred to as, as Boolean structures. Right? If you, if you think about it there, um, the alignment of uh, the initially deposited particles and then some that are later on, I have to sketch it. So. Let's say on the bottom surface, that's the first layer, and then afterward it's that. And it's opposite on the other surface. So that's, that's what gives rise to the symmetry breaking. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there an, I have a question. I mean, it's just a, a clarification, because you mentioned at the beginning uh, something about, I mean, I don't know if you were referring to graphene, but topological insulators and direct cones, is there some realization here or is it just a motivation for the work? Not yet. Okay. So um, I, I, think, I think we know sort of where, where are the pain points, right? We know what's the disorder in terms of the constituent building blocks and the disorder within the super lattice. Um, if, if the question is can you go from 6.5 nanometers plus or minus a unit cell to 6.5 nanometers like magic size cluster, everything is identical, like C60. Um, from a synthetic perspective, I'm, I'm skeptical, but I'm, I'm curious to what, what others might think as to how far you can, you can advance that. Um, I, I would like to think that there's a, a path to do that between now and 2040, but uh, we'll see. Okay. That's, uh, we'll, we'll get back to this slide, and we have 20, our list of projections. In 2040, we meet again. We'll laugh about it. <laughs> Okay, is there any other question? Okay, so what, we finish on time.